Well, thank you all for coming. Um, my name's Tom. I'm a partner at Atomico. For those of you that don't know Atomico, we're a European technology investment firm investing into the most ambitious founders emerging from across Europe, um, typically investing from Series A and beyond. Now, um, as part of my role and as, as head of research, uh, I helped to produce a report called The State of European Tech. Um, hands up who's familiar with that report. Has anyone had a look at it? A few of you. Okay, good. Still got work to do there um, to, uh, to spread the message more. Well, it's, it's a great pleasure to, to share with you some of our findings, and I hope to try and set um, your experiences being part of you know, the Parisian technology ecosystem, the French tech ecosystem, into the broader context of what's happening in Europe as a whole. Um, and this is really a report designed to take a data-driven and comprehensive approach to try and tell the story of you know, what's been happening in Europe um, today, looking back longitudinally over the past four or five years to you know, really pick out the key trends and then use that to project forward um, you know, into how we see things developing in the future. So it's really an attempt to kind of move the discussion around European technology beyond the headlines that we see, beyond all the skepticism, beyond the hype. For me, it's a great opportunity as a proud European to uh, actually feel good about Europe for once, being a, being a Brit too. Um, not always the case these days, I can say that. Right, well, let's, let's get into it. So what did we learn? Well, there's, um, you know, there's good news and, and there's bad news. The bad news is that each time I get up and talk about European tech, I sound like a broken record. The good news is that that's because I'm becoming a broken record talking about breaking records. Um, last year was once again a record-breaking year for European tech. We saw a record level of investments. We saw a record level of exits. We saw a record number of billion-dollar companies emerging from the region. Um, and in fact, if you look at you know, what happened in terms of big outcomes, big exits last year, if you exited for $2 billion, you didn't even make the top five of the year. It's pretty remarkable, given that you know, it's just a few years ago that people still questioned whether it was possible to build companies at that scale from here in Europe. Um, and so the fact that you saw numbers like that, the fact that three of the top 10 largest global tech IPOs um, worldwide last year came from Europe, you know, really give you an indication of how far things have moved. And of course, um, you know, beyond those big liquidity events, you also see that you know, in terms of companies choosing to stay private, choosing to um, you know, raise more funding before IPOing, really sort of grow in size away from exposure to the public markets, there's all sorts of companies you know, like that all across Europe today and you, know, you just have to think, for example, about the great crop of you know, leading European fintech companies to get some sense for, for those types of, uh, you know, those, those trends there. And again, when you look at the earlier stages too, in terms of the number of rounds, the level of capital being invested at Angel, um, you know, at Seed, you know, really those numbers, again, sort of doing what we all want to see in charts going up and to the, to the right. Um, and so, you know, I think to summarize, what you see is that we're harvesting the fruits of our earlier labor, but at the same time, we're seeing that more promising seeds for the future are being laid than ever before. And, you know, I suppose if you're sort of thinking about milestone events from last year, you have to reflect a little bit on Spotify. It was a, you know, 30 billion IPO, and even looking beyond that big headline figure, um, you know, to me, what was meaningful about that was that you know, this was a real um, example, unequivocal proof, if you like, that it's possible to think big, to think long term, to have giant ambitions, to raise capital, to hire the best talent, to go big on the global stage, to stave off ferocious competition and yet still come out on top. And I think, you know, really, it was a defining moment for European tech. Um, and I think the lesson from that is, you know, never let it be said to you that it's not possible to build amazing, incredible, hugely valuable companies that have impact on the global stage from here in Europe. 
Of course, you know, it's not going to be easy. Not everyone here who's a founder is going to make it. But don't believe for a second that it's not possible. And I think, you know, sort of going back to the broader um, macro context, you know, not only is it possible, all of you and all of the founders out there who are seeking to try and emulate or replicate that success, you're a critical part of the future of the European economy, full stop. Um, I'm sure you've seen the numbers, you know, economic growth in Europe as a whole has really flatlined in the second half of 2018. I believe growth for the Eurozone area um, was just 0.2%. That's the lowest rate we've seen um, for four years. You have large economies across Europe that are actually either on the verge of recession or in recession. Um, and so, you know, that's in stark contrast to what you're seeing in the tech industry as a whole, which, you know, even before that slump was growing, you know, five or six times faster than the rest of the economy as a whole. And now that gap is increasingly widening as growth within technology across Europe accelerates and as traditional industries stagnate or in many cases go into decline. And as a result, what you're seeing is workforce growth within the tech industry in Europe is booming. 4% um, growth year on year in 2018. That was an acceleration from the previous years. In context, again, you know, that compares to 1.1% growth for the whole economy um, here in Europe. France actually was the number one fastest growing um, tech workforce across the whole of Europe at 7.3%. So there's amazing things happening here. So tech is clearly bucking a trend of slow economic growth in Europe. It is the key bright spot for the future. And the data is proving you know, what we already um, instinctively knew is happening. And so, you know, as this has happened, it's transformed the performance of, of European VC generally. We thought in the report this year it would be interesting to take a look at the sources of funding. You know, what's ultimately the backstop in, in terms of funding for technology companies here in Europe? Um, and there's two things that I think that are interesting. You know, firstly, what were previously very conservative family offices um, have really turned their attention towards tech investment. Over the last five years, family offices and private individuals have invested more than $5 billion into European VCs. And I think you know, what's interesting is that today, at least, it's not pension funds, it's not sovereign wealth funds. It's actually governments, family offices, and then corporates that ultimately are those backstops for European technology funding. And so you know, when we look forward, I think what's interesting is, well, what's the potential that we can unleash when we finally are able to unlock capital at scale from the likes of the big pension funds and sovereign wealth funds here in Europe. So if 2017 we sort of described as this battle royale for talent, in 2018 the trend around talent we think was about this effective mobilization of talent across a whole new range and generation of hubs across the region. When you look at growth in terms of technology communities being built across Europe, the fastest growing ones are happening in places outside of the traditional strongholds of places like London, Berlin, and Paris. And so we think this is kind of set to change future talent flows um, here in the region. It's pretty remarkable um, when you um, learn that in tech, um, people who work in the tech industry are 10 times more likely in Europe to move border, um, but move across borders, you know, to, to take a role compared to the average EU citizen. It's a pretty remarkable fact. Now, um, I think what's interesting is that we sort of see that there's a new phase of talent mobility on the horizon. And actually, we kind of look at this in terms of, you know, three phases that we've gone through. If the first phase was about, you know, great talented entrepreneurs from here in Europe, taking an idea and moving to the US to build their company. And the second phase was about idea, uh, people with ideas choosing to stay in Europe, but building from one of the region's main hubs. We're entering a third phase where increasingly talented entrepreneurs from across the region will just stay where they are. Whether that's Tallinn, whether that's Lisbon, whether that's Montpellier, whether that's Cambridge, Oxford, or wherever it might be. And the more that that shift evolves, the more that you'll see, um, you know, basically a contraction of that 10x number. 
to revert closer to the average for the economy as a whole. So I'm going to try and wind things up. Um, and you know, people say that um, you only remember the last thing that anyone says in a presentation. And so with that in mind, we wanted to close on what we think was the most important section of the report that we published um, a couple of months ago. We think we all need to wake up to the diversity and inclusion challenges that exist within the technology industry in Europe today. So last year for the report, we resolved to put this issue front and center in terms of the report. We challenged all of the data partners that we have. We asked 5,000 people from across the European tech ecosystem to share their experiences. Because ultimately, if you can't measure something and you can't understand it, how can you hope to try and fix the issue? Um, and so we, you know, we set out to try and quantify this as best we can. It's not nearly enough, we don't think. Um, all the data makes for really painful reading. But you know, I think the reality is, is if these stats don't wake you up, then you know, I don't know what will. And it's clear that the challenges around this issue are bleak for Europe. Whilst the fundamentals of the tech ecosystem in Europe have never been stronger, monoculture and discrimination you know, are rife here um, across the European tech ecosystem. Just 7% of VC funds went to mixed gender or female only founding teams. The level of funding to other underrepresented groups is even lower than that. 46% of women have experienced discrimination whilst working in the tech industry. And so given those facts, it's kind of more surprising to us that when we asked those 5,000 people whether they felt that the culture of their company was inclusive, 75% of them said that it was. So I think what we took from that was, you know, when it comes to this issue, it always seems to be somebody else's problem. Um, so look, these results are shocking. The scale of the challenge around this issue is clearly enormous. We think it needs to be a first and foremost priority for the European tech ecosystem. And I think, you know, when you think about how much talent, how much value has evaporated, um, you know, I think it's clear, too, um, how much of an opportunity lies ahead if we can try and fix this. And once we can get the people of all demographics, of all experiences, of all backgrounds, feeling like this is an industry that's safe, that they can be confident to participate in, well, it's then that we'll reach our full potential. And I think you know, Europe's really benefited from a certain type of diversity. Um, you know, we're strengthened by the differences that we have here in the region. I think European tech is richer, certainly, for the diversity of cultures, of languages, of heritage that you find when you go from country to country. You know, we've not built an ecosystem that's the same as Silicon Valley, which is you know, really all clustered in a few square miles where everyone speaks the same language. It's not like China, where you, know, you have a government that's able to support the technology industry, that's able to help pick the winners in a closed market. But to reach the full potential of what we're building here, we really need to make use of all the amazing people that we have. And when we do that, then we'll go on to reach the full heights that we're capable of. So I'll leave it there. I probably overran by a few minutes. Um, and I think now what I'd like to do is invite um, all of my fellow panelists to come up. And then we'll sort of dig into some of these issues that I've talked through and then apply, hopefully, you know, a bit of a French and a, a Paris lens to, uh, to what we're seeing. So if you'd like to join me. So I'm going to switch from my book to, uh, to my phone, old school to new school. Um, thanks for joining us. What an amazing lineup. So I think we all know who everyone is. So I'm just going to get I'm going to get straight into it. Um, so clearly things have changed a huge amount in in five years here in you know. And I think you can answer this from a European perspective, or you can answer it from a French perspective. But when you look back over the last five years, what would you say has sort of surprised you or impressed you about the changes that you've seen um, you know, as it relates to the sort of tech ecosystem generally. And I'm going to get Eric, I'm going to go to you first. Hello everyone. Um, so I, I made my, my first company in 96, 
So I have like 20 years of uh, trying to, to, to build some, some startups. Uh, I lived uh, also in other places in, in, in Europe and I did a few, try to, to, to raise a, a few rounds on a few startups. And what definitely has changed now uh, compared to five years ago, in, in, in my opinion, is that uh, French companies can, or European companies, but many French companies, are really seen as bankable from, uh, let's say, at least uh, American VCs. And not only they, of course, agree to invest in the company, but now they don't ask specifically to flip the company. I have seen so many friends who raise some, some, some money from uh, American funds, top tier one funds, and mysteriously, <laughs> up, they disappear to uh, San Francisco, w w which is fine because you need to be in the US. But then, up, flip the company, and in France, you only have the engineers and uh, all the IP, all the real value is built in the US. And of course, it's because the, 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 the VCs are asking for that. And now, I think it's not always the, the case. And that's, I think, the biggest difference I have seen is like, France is now seen as bankable. Great. Alina, maybe I'll come to you. It's just anything that's really surprising? Um, Surprising in a in a oh, obviously in a good way is that we have more and more U.S. based or Asia based investors that are investing in our in our startups or scale ups. So this is good, really good in a sense because it means that we have created really nice assets. If I were to use a financial term, um, and companies that are bankable uh, and that are interesting for uh, for investors that have a global view of what's happening. Um, in the in the technology space, so that's a really good thing. The the bad thing is um, when you know the biggest the bigger a, a scale up gets, the more the capital comes from foreign investors. So there's a gap um, in the the funding environment where you see fewer European investors actually supporting those later stage firms. Um, so this gap is producing, and you've, and you've shown that in your report, but this is, it's still there. So there's an opportunity cost for um, European capital, our money, your money, um, because uh, we are not exposed enough to the future big successes of what the real economy is going to be. Um, so there's, you know, the, the glass is half empty, half full. Got it. So Erica, you, we were chatting before we, uh, we came up on stage, and... You, you talked about how funding rounds oh, yeah, are talked were. about. It was, it was funny, not yeah, just because you, you talked about the Slack <laughs> emojis, but you, to tell us a little bit about that, that difference, because I think actually as, a, as an anecdote for the changes, it was, it was a good one. Uh, no, no pressure. Yeah, so I have to be funny now. Um, so yeah, I'd like to tell this story. Uh, it's an anecdote that I think shows the evolution of the French ecosystem. Basically, in 2013, first year of the family, we had a company raised 400k seed round. That was crazy. We were so happy, we were celebrating, and we take any excuse, right, to throw a good party. Uh, and so we took the team and took the startups to a castle to celebrate this, you know, this milestone uh, in the family, our, big, our first big seed round. Um, and I was just telling Tom before going on stage that right now we have companies raising seed rounds on Slack, you know, like just uh, a Slack channel, like I'm raising a seed round and everybody commits on Slack and then it's like, okay, cool, an emoji, you know. <laughs> so it really goes to show that uh, we have now, you know, seed rounds or pre-seed rounds of uh, two, three million uh, euro that are raised uh, very easy, relatively easier. Um, and when you think about it, it's crazy, it's a 10x uh, growth in, uh, in a mere six years, so, yeah. You told it very well. Um, so so you're, you're all in your own way, entrepreneurs. You, you founded your own investment company. You both have done multiple companies. I think you were employee number one right yeah. here, yeah. Um, so maybe Alex, I'll, I'll come to you. Um, this is company 2.5, I think you told me earlier. That's right. Um, you probably could have chosen to build this company, Conto, anywhere, I would imagine. We sort of talked about this 10x mobility compared to the average EU citizen. Why did you decide Paris was right? 
Um, well, I think t two two aspects. Uh, first, let's say the, the the company itself, and then of course some personal reasons. But uh, so if I let aside the, the personal reason, I think for the um, for, for for the the industry we're in, so fintech, I think um, like the European market is already very uh, homogeneous. So like it's not really a huge change whether you're you know in Paris, in Amsterdam, or in London. I mean, soon London will be a bit different probably, but but still. Uh, and and so we just chose to found the company where we had you know the 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 most likely you know like strong. Um, uh, traction at the beginning, where we knew, you know, more people, uh, more, you know, beta users, more companies that we could, you know, test the product with, and um, yeah, and we just started, you know, with with what was easier for us in a way. Um, also, because we ha we founded Conso because we had suffered the pain from uh, business banking with our previous venture in France, so we knew that there was a big problem in France. We now know it's very similar in other European countries, so that's why we're expanding to other uh, countries later this year. But uh, yeah, we just started by you know what was closest to us and, and most likely to be a success, basically. Seems like it's working out pretty well as well. Um, so, so Eric, maybe I'll, maybe I'll come to you now. Um, you started your first company in 1996, I think you said. When you started out with Ledger, how would you describe the difference in ambition that you had for the organization that you know you set out to build. Is it the same as when you started that first company, or did you sort of you and your co-founders have a have a different different like end goal? Well, for sure, in '96 when I made my first company, I think I had no idea of what I was doing uh, because I didn't. For instance, when I had to deposit the capital, it was like fifty thousand French French francs. I have no idea if I will lose the capital or, or if I will get it back. So it's just to, to tell that uh, the point of uh, really uh, not knowledgeable I was. Um, and I, went, I just wanted to build something on the internet and I really didn't have any ambition. It was just uh, let's build it and let's see what happened. Uh, clearly with Ledger it was uh, really different uh, because uh, first of all, uh, we were on, and, and we are on, on the technology, blockchain, cryptocurrencies, which really had a, a lot of possibilities. And with experience, we can see these possibilities. You see more and more big round. You see there is much more money available when you want to, to, to raise. And so from the start, we had big, very big ambitions. Uh, it took us some time to, to, to go there and realize that this ambition was actually possible. But really, from the start, we set the company as, OK, let's build a real technological giant uh, with a future billion dollar uh, cap table, I mean, uh, market cap. Uh, it was just you know, in the head, because of course, I think everyone is dreaming about that. Uh, but when it became a potential reality, we are far from being there yet, huh? uh, then it was really amazing. And it is thanks to, I think, the, f the, the, the environment, the European environment, and the fact also that the, let's say the latest government is really trying to push all the startups and the ecosystem. It, it helps a lot. There, 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 there was at least a real Macron effect, and we really saw it when we did our capital raise uh, globally. Uh, again, like France was really bankable, and it really helped. So, so the, the, that different level of ambition came through so strongly in, in both of your answers. Alina and Erica, and maybe Alina, I'll come to you first. Is that is that perspective that you see from the entrepreneurs that you're meeting? Do you, do you see that kind of broadly, more frequently than, than you would have done in the past? Like how, do, how do you see that sort of next generation of up and coming French entrepreneurs? Yeah, so d definitely we see that there's um, every generation of entrepreneur every year, there's more ambition in the people that we have in front of us. They're increasingly well prepared, and this is probably thanks to you, <laughs> thanks to people like you guys, uh, because a lot of things can be taught, and obviously there's experience around that. So one is uh, you really the quality of the team and the ambition. Second is obviously the technologies that enable us to build global businesses, and then it's the ecosystem that is increasingly structured, and notably in France, um, for the early stages and for seeding the companies and starting things. So we really see that. Yeah, so um, actually what you say is true. We have uh, VCs 
like investors complaining to us like your founders or founders in general are too prepared <laughs> you know they've been watching videos they've been you know like it's harder to tell who's bad or not or like people know <laughs> to say to an investor like I'm focusing on my company I'm not fundraising and they're like just throwing themselves at you uh, so in that sense yeah we have a more mature ecosystem but like let's be real for a second it's really hard to be the company in Europe. We are far from, you know, like the Chinese or the US ecosystems. But that means, like what you both talked about, about ambition, that means that the people who do make it in France or in Europe are really, really ambitious founders. And they're, you know, the level of the, of the average founder, I think, that succeed in Europe is, is, is higher in that way because you have to be really resilient and really ambitious to succeed. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to you straight away, seeing as you, you made the point, which was it's, it's good to be realistic and, and objective and obviously so much has evolved really positively, but what are the challenges that, that still exist? Do you still see that there are hurdles that um, the companies that come, you know, and the founders that come through the family and, and equally you know, what, what you see, like what, what are the challenges? And, and I guess more importantly, what are the things that can be done to, to try and address them? How long do we have left? On the <laughs> Keep going. No, no, so um, challenges, so many. But um, I think that in many ways, um, one of the things we deeply believe at the family is that we can actually frog leap in the US in, in many aspects uh, with regards to um, you know, the social uh, aspects of entrepreneurship, like um, one of the co-founders of the family wrote a book called Hedge uh, about, you know, like how to create a safety net in the entrepreneurial age for, you know, people living in hectic kind of uh, journeys in, in their career. Um, so in those topics, I think we can leapfrog, but basically, I mean, Elena said uh, some of it. We need more investors in growth and late stage. Um, we need more talent. I mean, uh, in, uh, in France especially, we don't have the Facebooks and the Dropboxes and the Googles where we can, you know, poach talent. So it's really hard. And, and now it's, you know, it's, a, it's a helping that we have more and more big companies uh, hiring and growing their teams. But then, you know, there's like less talent to go around and people are becoming, you know, quite aggressive <laughs> when hiring. Uh, but, you know, I, I will let... Uh, people like others. Eric who've done yeah. many companies and it's great that they're also contributing to, contributing to the ecosystem and it's great also to see uh, several generations of firms that have been successful and Eric you're part of that. Yeah absolutely like uh, we have second time founders and founders right. who have exited their companies are investing angel investing so that's those are the good things so I was talking about like more of the challenges but um, we need more of that for sure. See so thank you. you you mentioned talent and um, when I was on the Eurostar on the way over I was looking at LinkedIn and looking at the, the teams that, that both of you have built. And you, you know, you've both scaled to 100, 150 employees, something like that. And what really struck me was you know, a few interesting trends when you, when you look at not only the scale and the speed with which you've been able to grow like that, so clearly you're having success in finding talent, but if I'm not mistaken, you've both got people in your executive leadership teams who been there and done it before. You both succeeded in bringing talent from the US to come over here and, and help you build your companies. You both, I think, interestingly tapped people from traditional industries and incumbents. So, yeah, talk, talk a little bit about you know, some, of those, some of those trends. How, how, have you find, how have you found the challenge of getting the right people to help you scale your organization to the next level, you know, like, because these are the types of people that take you from not just 100, but to 1,000. Um, so maybe Alex, you go first. And Depends how much time we have indeed. <laughs> no, but uh, I think briefly, uh, of course, the team is, is the key to everything. So, um, and every, every step, you know, every stage of, uh, of, of your growth requires probably, you know, different uh, expertise or different strengths. So it's, uh, it's very important to either make sure you know the, the current team can you know like learn and grow and get more skills that you would need for, you know further down the road, or to get you know uh, new people joining joining the team. And actually, you probably need both. Um, I think in terms of uh, trends, um, I mean we've been so when we started, maybe when I look at you know Contos past like the last two years. 
two and a half years, uh, we've we've um, hired more and more women. I mean, relatively to the fintech industry, and you know, it's both fin and tech, so it's uh, not very easy to get women. But basically, we have uh, I checked this morning actually, so we have 34 percent of uh, women on the team. I think we have more and more, and uh, definitely uh, what you said, but more and more. I said non-French uh, people joining the team. Either they've been in France for a couple of you know years or months, or uh, they they relocate to uh, to Paris to to join us, uh, which is great for us and probably also great for the ecosystem as a whole. Um, and indeed, um, we started with having only non, uh, let's say, ex-bankers on the team and. Because we really wanted to have like the you know a, a, a team that would you know create and and like kind of you know don't you know uh, do not take it anything for granted and just really you know would 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 be able to um, uh, to to shake you know what we're, the incumbents were doing. But now of course, as we're getting a bit larger and say a bit more serious. Uh, we we need to have some people that you know know well as well the, the the rules of the game, and it's 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 important to have a few people who you know uh, who uh, at least have a good understanding of uh, you know what regulation is, what compliance is, and so on, uh, and to find the right balance between between both let's say uh, uh, spirits. Uh, Eric, anything that you would add on top of that? Well, finding talent is quite difficult. It is also quite ex expensive. I mean, there is a truth to that. Uh, we went from 20 to 200 in two years. And if Ledger was able to attract some top talents because of the story, etc., just to find the talent, it, it costs a lot. Uh, so that's, uh, that's also a, a truth. Uh, because Pres Presumably that's an investment you're happy to make? Yeah, yeah of course. Uh, but it's, there is no, I mean, maybe there is some magic, but there is also a lot of, uh, of, of investment, a lot of cost. Um, and uh, when we started to scale Ledger, I think we, st we spent a, a lot of time in priority to, to, to find talent in some areas that could be strange for a tech company. Uh, one of our first top hire was a general counsel, uh, then uh, VP people, uh, CFO. Uh, we, we put a high priority on trying to, to, to build very strong uh, support teams. Uh, because if you want to, as if you have a big ambition and you want to big, uh, big build a big company, it's very important not to create some ad administrative debt. Uh, and start really uh, by uh, doing all the compliance, all the legal, all the, the finance. So this is how we, we did it. And uh, basically by having all these teams, it helped us also to, to, to build the rest because when you have a very strong HR team with a lot of people working to find talent, it really helps uh, because then you are less dependent from external, uh, let's say, uh, agents. So I think it's uh, it was a good approach to uh, to let's say to build first the team with be able to 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 find the rest of the team. So you've been able to build and recruit a lot of A players, if we want to call them that. And one of the things they say is you know A A players will hire more A players. Have you found that that's played out that way? That by bringing in these people that are magnets for more talent, it actually Yes, helps you with the next level. No, of course, uh, when we, I mean, one of the first, not higher because he was already here at the board level, but uh, Pascal Gauthier, who comes from the, the, the Criteo uh, team, the fact that he was here, that he joined us operationally as uh, president, it really helped to, to, to get people because they say, okay, uh, the company looks good. If this guy is here and then this guy is here, it helps gi give some credibility and it helps to, to close, uh, let's say, the candidates. Because what you, what you need to sell, basically, is not really the package of how much you are going to get paid because there is a limit to the game, but it's about the, the stock, the BSPC, uh, because you give some package and, some, and they have to renounce to a previous package. Sometimes they, they, they let go on the table hundreds of thousands of euros to come. And so they have really to believe of the future value of the stocks. And the fact that you have an A team really helps to give some credibility to that. Can, yeah, please do. If I can add to that, there is also an uh, interesting movement that, that we've seen, and you've probably, probably seen that at your company's level. It's the number of people coming from very different industry that want to come to tech, 
So it's not only uh, A people coming from Criteo or so on, it's from the public administration, from different industries, uh, from you know research or whatever. And I think this is a very deep sign of what's happening and this is what makes me the most optimistic about the industry. It's not only the money, it's mostly the talent that is going there and I think the best minds in very different industries are coming to tech, whether as founders or as employees or, or board member or whatever. They just want to be part of it. And if these guys go to the tech industry, they, they, don't, they don't go anywhere else. And that means it's you know all the more we can be very optimistic about what's going to happen in the tech space. I want to also, um, there, is, there is also another trend that I've seen at my, at my personal level. But um, so from a year ago, more or less, um, I've been seeing more and more uh, people move uh, from the US, uh, relocate to Paris. Uh, so it started with all the French people who left uh, to live in San Francisco or other ecosystems, and they started coming back. And I, I, you know, I attribute it to two things. Like the first is Trump. Like let's not kid ourselves, but a lot of people said like I'm out of here when he won. Uh, the second thing is that um, there are more mature startups. There's more funding, and so now companies they can afford someone who's been I don't know at, at say Buffer for four years, and and they want to you know work for a startup in France. They can afford that kind of talent now because they have uh, the right funds, uh, and that really changes a lot. And and also like you, the stock, as you said, is is, is worth more. It's perceived as as value. Uh, having a higher value and that really helps attract uh, talent and so now it started with French people as I said and now I'm seeing I'm getting interest to people from you know like Americans or from anywhere uh, saying I want to I want to move to Paris so I think the the hunt for talent is is always a challenge and for a lot of companies there inevitably comes a point where you must exhaust the local talent supply and one of the trends that that we picked out in the report and have done over a couple of years now is, is almost a tendency to start to build in a bit more of a distributed way. So you start in one city and then you add additional locations and that might be partly commercially driven as you get closer to your customers, but certainly one thing that we see more and more is you know it's talent driven and it's about finding access to new pools of talent. Is that something that any of you see or is it something that you consider doing? Um, for your companies, if you felt it was the you know the right move. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, for for, for sure, uh, especially from the business development and commercially, because you're right, you need to be uh, close to your uh, customers. Uh, we opened uh, San Francisco, New York, Hong Kong, and we, we we took some local top talents in the industry who really had uh, very good know-how of how to approach institu institutional uh, customers, uh, financial institutions for our uh, SaaS solutions, uh, and it it would have it's not possible to do that uh, anyway from uh, from France because you you have to speak the language, you have to be local, you have to travel a lot, and then it costs a, a fortune. In, in, in travel and there is some kind you know of sales people like you need sometimes the American guys to, to sell to the Americans so um, from the engineering point of view uh, I think that there is a so strong talent uh, base in France and in Europe that I don't think that we will need at, at, at the level at ledger at least to, to open other uh, let's say offices for, for that but for business development, uh, that's, uh, that's really clear that we had to do it. I, I think for the, the business development parts, that's, that's clear, but um, I, I believe that might be not exactly your question time, unless I'm mistaken. I think it's, uh, to, to us, I mean, of course, if you want to open in Italy, it's easier if you have an office there. But even for the tech and product teams, uh, we're considering having different hubs. Um, um, I mean, not not necessarily going very far from from here, but uh, we know we've had some uh, quite a few um, applications from uh, great people based in I don't know in Lyon, in Marseille, in Bordeaux, wherever in in France, or or maybe a bit further. But uh, and of course they won't commute, and of course you know it, and 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 so either they um, they work remotely or they you know they're they're not with you. But we're not very big fans of working like remotely alone you know at your place so we're trying to uh consider 
opening maybe local hubs where you know you can have five, ten people working in whatever Lyon, Bordeaux, Nantes, whatever the the exact city. Uh, so this is probably something we'll be testing uh, this year. So since you mentioned cities other than Paris, and you know, of course, it's one of the notable things when you compare French tech to you know to, to Germany or to the UK is that it's you know it's much more centralized. But there's also signs that things are happening in other cities. So I, I, Erica or Alina, is, is that something that you see? Do you find yourself interacting more with founders based in other cities? Um, so one, the first thing is what you said, Alexandre, is uh, the fact that the, our companies are kind of forced to have distributed pools of talent. And that means a lot in terms of how you organize your firm and it's, uh, the CTO jobs becomes much more complicated and it's more of an organization role. So we see that play out. So that's the first, first stage. Then second stage is, um, do we see companies emerge from other hubs? Yes, we do. Um, statistically, they won't uh, you know, pass um, before Paris because they're statistically, they're, I mean, Paris is so centralized. And then the thing is, the capital remains concentrated in a few hands and they're mostly here. Um, and so that's an issue. I mean, it means that as an investor, we have to travel a lot, uh, but that's part of the job and you have to be in close touch with your firms wherever they are. Um, but the, the pool of capital, unfortunately, is not distributed. It's quite centralized. Um, so we, we actually, yeah, we see this trend. Um, we believe that a great entrepreneur can come from anywhere. Um, and one of the things we decided to do last year was to start a European tour where we are visiting you know, tech hubs all over, all over Europe to kind of see what's happening out there and, and discover these entrepreneurs you know, wherever they are. And, and part of the, the bet that we're making at the family is that we are present in London, Paris, and Berlin, but these are not um, like chapters of the family. It's more of a distributed experience. So we are able to give you know, the best access to the best network and the best people to, to any of those companies wherever they're based. Um, and yeah, in, in terms of uh, remote workers, it's definitely a trend. There was a law that passed in France uh, last year, I believe. Uh, don't quote me on it because I don't have the exact information, but it's something like uh, now anyone can work remotely. Like before it was an exception and now any comp and every company has to allow any worker to be able to work remotely. Um, and I think that globally with this trend, we're already working remotely. We're just all going to the same place to do it. I was, saw this on a tweet the other day. I really liked it. Um, but yeah, with Slack, email, and, and all these collaborative tools, we, we already you know, have everything we need to, to be able to you know, have distributed teams. So I, I guess what you can take from that is that European tech, is, you know, and often people will criticize it for this, is it becomes sort of more fragmented, if you like. There's stuff happening. And, in cities all over the region. Actually, when we've looked at it, there's a certain level of interconnectedness that happens because capital and talent and even knowledge you know, flows between those cities. So sometimes there might be a perception from the outside that perhaps Paris has not necessarily been the most interconnected with other hubs. What's, is, that, is that a fair criticism? What's your, what's your experience been in terms of interconnectedness between the sort of major hubs across Europe? I mean, for sure, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a truth. Like, Paris is, 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 like, France is very centralized. Everything is happening in Paris. All the big companies and headquarters are there. But at the same time, for people who are outside of France, it makes it really easier. Because if you, you know, try to navigate Germany, right? Uh, you have to go to this uh, Hamburg for this and to Munich for that. And, you know, it's, I mean, maybe it's... Uh, I don't know if it's better or worse, actually. That's what I'm trying to say, I guess. What do you think? Well, I think that it's not exactly answering your question, but uh, it's true that it's quite centralized in France, in Paris. But the benefit to have uh, like uh, an office or a place not in Paris, but in a city in France, uh, in region uh, can be very uh, interesting, especially if you are looking for some some grants or you know from BPI or because in Paris there is like so many people and if you are uh, for, for our case we have uh, uh, an office in uh, Vierzon uh, it's in the center of France uh, and uh, really when we went to see BPI uh, Orléans. Uh, 
well, you know, it's uh, much more easy to get access. Uh, and it also works for, for the, the place because now, uh, after all that, we have invested uh, in a big factory there and creating so, some jobs. So it's really much easier to develop your company if you do not that in Paris. So there are like big advantage to do it. Uh, I'm having a slightly different answer. So sure. maybe, maybe it's because yeah. uh, I understood your question as is Paris as connected to other hubs as. Would you know London, yeah. London or Berlin be? It's good that you all take different okay. angles. I like <laughs> yeah. it. It's good. No, but, but so I, I think uh, I think the overall like French, uh, let's say, um, spirit is evolving a bit with you know people being maybe m more open and speaking more English and so on. I mean, it's it's been long you know like long criticism that you know people would say oh uh, in cafes people would not you know speak to you in English they would be you know very rude blah blah. So. I think it's it used to be true. Uh, now it's it's I, I hope and I guess much less uh, true, uh, and and uh, and I hope that now and uh, this is what we see. I mean, I, I see that on a daily basis, but uh, at least on a at a company level, that more and more people uh, see Paris not only as a very uh, nice uh, you know destination for honeymoon or whatever romantic you know uh, trip. But also as a place they, you know, they consider relocating to uh, for, you know, for a great uh, tech challenge and a, you know, tech job basically. Uh, and I think that's that's indeed quite uh, new. Uh, I believe that Brexit might be helping a bit uh, on on this front. Uh, so Brexit is not bad for everyone. Let's put it that way. Uh, and. Um, and so yeah, I mean it's it's uh, it's probably a bit less international. At least the 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 perception of Paris is probably a bit less international when it comes to tech than it would be for London or Berlin or potentially Barcelona. Uh, but I think it's a very big tech uh, scene, um, probably actually much larger than Barcelona, much larger than Stockholm, which is supposed to be a you know like the Nordics hub. And uh, probably uh, larger as well as uh, you know than than Tel Aviv or the Israeli ecosystem. So I think in yeah in Europe it's definitely a large uh, a large tech ecosystem, and uh, and I guess the, the the trend is is very positive. So yeah, of course you can. Um, and the thing is, it's large enough. I mean, the French market is large large enough as a market for investors or founders to focus on it only, whereas in some other smaller countries in Europe, naturally they tend to be more connected because they have no choice. So that's an element of culture, but that I, I think it's, is reducing over time because founders have so much ambition and they're trying to um, go abroad quite quickly. But the thing is, yeah, the, the mar French market is large enough for you to focus on it for a number of years. Great, well, before we go, to some questions from the audience. I, with my presentation, I you know, finished on what we felt was an important issue, and I think it would be good to spend a few moments to, to talk about diversity and inclusion, which is you know, clearly a, one, one of the outstanding challenges for tech globally and, and tech in Europe and, and, and tech in France too, I'm sure. So it would be great to hear how are you approaching um, this within your organizations. And what I mean by this, I mean building a more diverse and a more inclusive you know, workplace. Um, hopefully because you see that that's something that you know, can help your companies to perform better. So I don't, I don't know who wants to go first, um, otherwise I'll pick on someone. It's the question nobody wants to take. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I like to say, as I was the first person in, at the family, I like to say they checked all the boxes with me because I'm, you know, I'm a woman, I'm an immigrant, I'm originally from the Dominican Republic, so. I am only not gay, but you know, <laughs> it would have checked everything with me. But um, so yeah, it's something that we really care about. Somehow, uh, I guess it's because we don't have like a, a lot of developers in our team, but we we are more or less 50-50 at the family uh, in the women men ratio, and and we. So I'm not going to talk about our team because it's it's mm. really probably not relevant. But um, in in we do look for diversity in the in the founding teams. Uh, that we recruit, so because I, I think the lack of diversity we see sometimes in the in the in the companies that are being created, you know, solving uh, I'm not gonna be cliche, but like white male problems, uh, that's the lack of diversity we see in the founding teams, you know. 
because usually people solve problems that they encounter themselves in their lives. So we try to um, go and, and, and do talks in schools. We, we bring high schoolers uh, to the family. We do things with like uh, in France they call it like start of value and things like that. Um, and try to you know look for uh, different sources of, of deal flow. And in the team, I, I, Alice and I, as, as you know the, the part of the directorship team, we try to be more aware of of our role as, uh, you know, like setting the example and representing, you know, for the for the other uh, new, new women in the in the team. So, there you go. Um, it's indeed the question you want to have now, uh, but uh, I think two two parts of uh, in my answer. First one is, I think it's quite tough when you're building a company to be you know trying to do everything at the same time so i'd be honest in saying that uh it's already super hard and so you know when you have already tons of things to do saying okay am i you know like helping others while i'm building my company if i may say is it's it's usually tough to kind of do both at the same time uh, but then second part of the answer is that, uh, of course, among the team and now that we have like a larger team and, and you know, more like, uh, let's say, uh, financial means, of course, we're trying to, you know, get the right balance. So I was talking about like the, you know, male-female ratio. Also from day one, we started having everything written in English and like really trying to communicate in English only, although some uh, team members would like to learn French, so it's not maybe the, the best way for, for them to learn French. Uh, but, uh, but still, we're trying to be very inclusive uh, for, for, all, uh, for all team members, and we have more and more non-French speakers joining. Um, and um, yeah, I think we're, we're trying to uh, you know, uh, implement more and more trainings and more and more you know, ways to uh, make sure that the team is not only there you know, as, you know, as, as a job, but also like you know, learning, growing, and and uh, and and yeah, and, and improving day after day, and like having kind of a learning pass and a, and a developing pass with uh, with Conto. So this uh, started, you know, probably when we reached like 50 employees, and we um, hired our uh, HR manager. We started like really really focusing on 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 people and and talent uh, development. Uh, but yeah, that's that would be uh, my my answer. Thank, thank you. So, Elena, when I come to you, as, a, as an investor, how, how do you think about it? What, what responsibilities do investors have? And yeah, um, so actually, yeah, we, have a, we do have a lot of responsibilities. Our, at our stage of investment, um, we cannot solve the, the biases uh, that have been you know, created way before us. So it starts at university, where you have a few women that do embrace scientific studies, etc. So there are a number of different stages where the problems need to be solved. And at our level, even though we took a radical approach at Gaia, we're two female uh, funding partners, <laughs> but we'll try to have a diverse team. Um, so we're, you know, it's a nice we, we feel have. we have a role there, but we can't solve for everything. So our answer there is, um, What's great, it's um, that founders or teams that come from a diverse background, they have so many hurdles that they have to go through that statistically they perform better than the others. So for us, in terms of, so it's, I'm taking a very rational approach here. We, um, we're not being emotional about it. We're being super rational. So you have people that are more diverse and that are more performant because they've have to go, they had to go through so many difficulties. So that's one. So in terms of performance for us, we really should focus or prioritize our deal flow on people that have been through this. Um, that's one. Then over time, obviously, you have to help your companies, growth stage companies, go through diversifying their teams. And we know it takes effort, and we know it takes it's more cost because you have to find these uh, diverse people. So we have to, you know, make sure that over time the workforce in our companies reflects what the society what society is, and we have to make sure that there are um, as well more female founders because there are a lot of problems that won't be solved if um, more fem if if not if women don't start entrepreneurial careers and if you know more diverse people don't start that. And so what we can do at our level 
is put more light on people that do come from those diverse backgrounds. So we can't solve for the bias, but we can over market or, or uh, put more emphasis in our communication on these ladies, these, these colored people that do start companies. So that's the only thing we could do so that we create more inspirational roles. Um, and then over time, hopefully, it's going to solve the thing. So Eric, I'm going to give you a chance to. to well, I, I think it's, well, it's very hard to have like true diversity when you build a, a business because you cannot make choices that are driven by that, especially when you are only uh, 50, 100, it doesn't make sense. But what you can do uh, is, of course, try to, to adapt the, the, the culture to, especially when you have a technological culture based on, based on trolls and a lot of things which can be quite aggressive sometimes. You, you, you have to, to take that into account and try to, to evolve it to avoid uh, uh, like you know the, the, the drugs that you should not, should not have done. Uh, that is so easy to do on Slack. So that's part of things that you can do uh, to have the, the best environment possible. And also diversity is ab about uh, cultures, languages. And as you said, it's important to be inclusive, uh, to have everything in English. Uh, and also as we, we have some um, uh, some, some people in Vierzon who doesn't speak uh, English. Uh, we do all the OLENs, for instance, uh, with uh, like uh, real-time translations. So we try to help like that so everyone can either speak French or speak English and have the translation and, and be included. So there are some practical things that you can do uh, to, to be inclusive. It's not only about the, the gender diversity because that's not something you can really control at the beginning. Uh, but obviously making everyone feel welcome uh, is the most important thing that you have to do. Great. So before we go to the, the audience, I'm going to give you some quick fire questions. So one word answers. Um, which is off script, but um, <laughs> so so first one, simple one. French government net positive or net negative for the tech ecosystem here? Net positive. Just two words. Two words. True. <laughs> positive. positive. Yeah. Positive. <laughs> yeah. Positive. Well, I can't say negative now. <laughs> yeah. Consensus. Okay. Boring question. Yeah. Right. Next one. So, can we see ten billion dollar companies from France in the next five years? Of course. Yes, you have two already. So. <laughs> yeah, you have to believe. <laughs> yes. Okay, you're going to all say yes to this next question, so I'm not even going to ask it. Right, that was a bad idea. Um, so um, I'll just ask you all to give a huge round of applause to all of our wonderful panelists. <laughs>